12 September 2024 marks 100 years since the birth of the African revolutionary Amilcar Cabral. Leading the struggle against Portuguese colonialism, Cabral believed that we must always bear in mind that the people are not fighting for ideas, for the things in anyone's head. They are fighting to win material benefits, to live better and in peace, to see their lives go forward and to guarantee the future of their children. Until now, he remains one of the most influential leaders, particularly for young people struggling against imperialism today. Just over a year ago, at the Dilemmas of Humanity Pan-African Dialogues to Build Socialism conference in Bilebela, South Africa, we sat down with Nyarbat Nankaya Inchaso, a Politburo member of the African Party for the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde, the PAIGC. Here is her story and reflections which we share on the momentous centenary of Gabriel's birth. My name is Nyarbat Nankaya Inchaso from Guinea-Bissau and I am a member of Political Bureau of PAIGC, the party of Amilcar Cabral. I joined the party Amilcar Cabral in 1963. I was just 11 years old and I was among the children which were taken to uh, Guinea Conakry, where PAIGC had HQ headquarters and um, for education, because one of the main objective of Milkar Cabra was to educate children so that they are the future of the what we were fighting for. And the, as you can imagine, after the, the, the struggle for independence, Guinea Bissau had about 99% of the population illiterate. So Amilcar Cabral gave emphasis to educate children for the future. So I was among those children who were taken to Guinea Conakry, where we had a pilot school the school called Pilot School because it was a, a first school that was founded by Amilcar Cabra by PAGC. And uh, there I studied with other children. And after that, I was sent to Czechoslovakia with other children where I got my further study. Uh, education was very important for us for the for PAEGC because one of the objective if to decolonize the 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 the, the, the of children because as you can imagine during the colonization children who had privilege to go to school they did not study history of Guinea Bissau they did not know anything deeply about Guinea Bissau, their own country. They were studying Portugal. If you ask a, a child, um, where is the, the main river of Guinea Bissau? He did not know. But if you ask him, where is situated main river in Portugal? He will be able to tell, tell you everything. So that was very important to change, to make children know their own history, to know their own country. So uh, that was my life, but the first life, I was among the first children that were taken to Guinea Conakry to uh, study. What mobilized the people to fight against Portuguese colonialism? Guinea Bissau was over 500 years years under the Portuguese oppression, 500 years. Portuguese did not do anything to better the life of people of Guinea-Bissau. We did not have school. We had only one high school in the capital, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Bissau. only one high school. 
no many people had privilege, the privilege to go to school because um, the people were classified as indigenous and the civilized. And those civilized had privilege to go to school and not many of them. And people were forced to work to build, for example, uh, roads that was forced work. People were forced to pay uh, taxes and each head of, of the of family had to pay a tax. People had to work falsely in everywhere. So there's no, no health conditions, no education system for the people of Guinea-Bissau. 99% of the pe people in Guinea-Bissau were illiterate. And the Cabral was the first engineer in Guinea-Bissau. Can you imagine that? So all these things had to fight for our right. And this motivated Amilcar Cabral with other colleagues that founded PAUJC in 1956 to do something to get the people of Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde Island out of oppression, Portuguese oppression. That was the, what motivated people to get uh, liberated from the oppression, Portuguese oppression, to be free to decide about their destiny, to have a dignity. Because if you do not have health, if you do not have education, you cannot decide about what you want. You do not have a dignity. Somebody is telling you what to do. So this is what motivated PAUJC to uh, get to struggle for the independence, to get f to be free, and have its own uh, dignity in, in Geneva, to give them better life than they had under the Portuguese colony. What was the nature of women's participation and political work in the national liberation struggle, and how were you initially involved? Women had a decisive participation in, 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 in Guinea-Bissau. As from the beginning, because even Amilcar Cabral always motivated women to participate actively, actively because he said, Women in Guinea-Bissau were exploited twice. They were exploited by the Portuguese system, and then they were exploited by their own uh, husband at home. So he said, you women, you have to fight for your right. And you, we can see that during the, the, the struggle for independence, we had really women who participate actively as men. They were also in front line as men. They were uh, nurses, they were educators, they were, uh, I mean, political, actively participate in education, political education of women. So they were the one helping combatant in the, in the in jungle because this was guerrilla war. So women did all this. They were educators, they were fighters in, in, in during the, the liberation war. And one of the examples we can just give, it is heroes, national hero, Titina Silla, who fought in front line as men. Carmen Prera, who fought, Kainan Tunge, who fought during the 72 days that Portuguese invaded an island called Island Com. And Kainan Tunge was one of women who really played a decisive role to get 
the porches out of that island. And it lasted 72 days. He was, she was killed. She was pregnant at that time, and she was killed. Because they found that uh, she was helping uh, gorillas. Yeah. Because she, when they were fighting, they have to eat. They, so she, what she did is to fetch water for, for the, the, the combatant. And she was, a Portuguese found her, and she was killed. So just to uh, mention a few names, as I said, Titina Silla, Kainan Tunge, but there were many other uh, women who fought actively for the independence of Guinea-Bissau. Yes. And uh, I, myself, as I said, I was in school, pilot school, and then I was sent to Czechoslovakia to study. What were some of the challenges you faced in the struggle for national liberation? There were uh, challenges because many challenges. Uh, to overcome all these challenges was not an easy task. Um, in, when Portuguese were controlling the whole country and the, we had a fight to gain a liberated zone and we had really to create conditions so that uh, the, 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 the struggle could uh, go on in a very organized way. It was not easy because you could not get anywhere uh, so easily. Portuguese were controlling the whole country. But uh, the liberated zone where we begin organizing, PHSA begin organizing the life to give them the minimum, to give the people minimum uh, conditions. That means it began to put school in that liberated zone, organize popular justice at liberated zone, and also to create condition for health, health, health care that was necessary to educate. Education was the biggest challenge because most of the, these uh, women uh, and population in general were illiterate. So the challenge was education and health to create the minimum conditions in the liberated zone so that the uh, people could participate actively in that life. 1973 was a significant year, from the deaths of Titina Silla and Amilka Cabral to the Declaration of Independence. Where were you then, and how did you see these developments unfolding? 73 was a challenging and decisive year for PAGC, for the struggle. Amilcar Cabral was assassinated on 19, uh, 20 January 1973. The background of this all, the Portuguese thought that killing Amilcar Cabral, they will stop the struggle for the independence. But that was totally wrong. After they have assassinated Amilcar Cabral, in 20 January, in 10 September the same year, we declared the state, the assembly declared independence unilaterally in Medina du Bois, unilaterally. Because after the assassination, uh, with all this anger, and we decided, PHSA decided, the guerrilla decided, to use the army that we did not use before, in all front. That was a stroke to uh, the Portuguese at that time. And we de declared, unilaterally declared independence. The Portuguese then, uh, one year later, 
after negotiation, they accepted the independence of Guinea-Bissau. At that time, I was still studying. I was a student in Czechoslovakia because I went to study in 1966. I did high school there and university. I finished my study in 1974, eight. I, I returned to Guinea-Bissau. It was very hard for all of us. We were raised, I said this in race, created with Amilcar Cabral. We were children when we joined the, 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 the fight for liberation. And Cabral was as our father. And when we heard that Amilcar Cabral was assassinated, it was, we did not know what to do. And we, was, we were confused, saying, are we going to be able, able to continue our fight to get our independence after Cabral was killed? But Cabral did something. He always said, if one day I'm not here, if one day I'm, uh, I'm killed, not here among you, there, were, there are many Cabrals that will continue the fight. And that's what happened. And uh, certainly when we heard that he was killed, assassinated, we were confused, but then we said, no, we have to continue to honor Amilka Kawara. That was our first reaction, confusion. But then we said, we have to go ahead with the struggle and to get our independence. Had you had any interaction with Pan-Africanism at this point? In 1972, um, when I finished my high school and returned to Guinea-Conakry, because Guinea-Conakry was our uh, headquarters of PAIGC in Guinea-Conakry. And uh, um, in 1972, I know that there was a Pan-Africanism um, conference in Mongolia, in, in Ulaanbaatar. And uh, there were three women that were invited to participate in that conference in, in Mongolia. There were Francisca Pereira, uh, Teodora Inacia Gomez, and Lucette Cabral. They were the, the, the big combatants, the women. And they were invited to participate in that conference in Mongolia, Pan-African uh, conference in, in, of women in Mongolia. And um, these three women were uh, invited to participate in that conference. And one of them could not go, who was Theodora Inazia Gomez. So Cabral called me and said that you, I have to participate uh, as a delegate to, to participate in that conference in Mongolia. So he called me to join the delegation to go. That was my first experience to participate in such a conference, a uh, Pan-Africanism conference in, in, in Lambertor. So that was my first participation actively in such an uh, event concerning Pan-Africans. And there were women who participated also, like uh, Amilcar, uh, how they call it, Carmen Prera, and uh, other women that participated in conferences actively as a Pan-Africanist in, 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 in different events that were organized, uh, Pan-Africanist organized that Francisca Pereira, uh, Lucette Cabral, uh, even uh, Titina Silla participated in one of the conference at that time. So by myself, that was my first experience participating in Mongolian Pan-Africanist conference in, in, in Mongolia. So uh, as I was a student at that time. 
What were the goals of national reconstruction and what challenges stood in its way? We have a lot of challenges after the independence because uh, the country, uh, as I described later on, uh, it's a poor country with high literacy uh, in Guinea Bissau and also health system was not organized the way it should be. So um, this was the challenges that we have to uh, education system to address educa education and also health care situation in Guinea Bissau. Uh, if children, we had high, I mean, level of illiteracy in Guinea Bissau, and we had to address that question of education. Um, we had to help address question also of health. We had only one hospital in Guinea Bissau to attend uh, the population in Guinea Bissau. And the, if you go to villages, you would not find a, a health center to attend population in Guinea Bissau. So social uh, uh, factors were two biggest factors to address in Guinea Bissau. And also, we had to economically address the problem of agriculture because we always said that agriculture was the basis of economy in Guinea Bissau. And for that, you have, we have to uh, create conditions to better conditions so that we could produce more in Guinea Bissau. As to say, again, to finish, I would like again to thank this opportunity. But I would say that what Pan-Africanism is doing, it is uh, giving us all forces to, to show us that there is possible to liberate ourselves. There is possible to liberate Africa, that we fought for the independence. But can we ask now that we have independence? It is not only to have a, a, a flag, it's to have the people to feel this independence, to feel what we fought for. And in many countries which fought for the independence, the people, grassroots people, do not till now feel the, 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 the reason they, they fought for us. So we need to continue fighting to better uh, life of the people. And Cabral always said, you cannot um, be satisfied that you get your independence. The independence is, you, you may feel that you have independence when people get their life better. So we, this is what we continue fighting to, for the betterment of the people, for the betterment of the living conditions of the people in Guinea-Bissau. Amilcar Cabral, he was an incredible, incredible woman, human being. He liked children. At that pilot school, the beginning, after I left, it was enlarged that they received more children. But at the time, I was still at pilot school. We were about 100 children. And can you imagine that every morning when Cabral got up, he went to pilot school at six o'clock in the morning to find out if everything is okay with children there. And uh, at that school, we were like military school because we had to get up at five o'clock in the morning, do exercise, then we go for take our breakfast and then go to school. The older children helped the smaller children. We were the one who cooked. We have to learn how to cook. We had uh, adult controlling, but we were the one doing the work. We had to get up in the morning clean, 
the, 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 the dorm, clean the school, we were the one doing that. As I said, the older children took care of younger children, not because the, old, the adults were not there, but we were, it has to be, this is something we had to learn to take care of ourselves. And uh, it was a, an, an experience, a very exciting experience that we had, a, a pilot school in Guinea-Bissau. And uh, I, I cannot for, forget what Amilcar Cabral did for me, because when I talk, I'm, I'm, I don't personalize myself, but I talk about children of Guinea-Bissau children who did not know, who were taken to pilot school, school, they did not know how to read, read and write. Their, their, their father, their family, their parents did not know how to read and write. And these children were taken and were given education. And now they are people, cadre that is, developing the country. And that was the Cabral's dream, to educate it. But he said, you cannot build a country with illiterate people. You have to educate. So education, education was a center to decolonize the, the, the mentality of children, to get the children to know their own story. And I'm privileged that I was part of children that were there, that were educated by Milkar Kavra. I'm proud of it. So. What was your initial experience with international work and internationalism? Well, uh, after I concluded my study in Czechoslovakia, I returned to Guinea-Bissau and uh, I was engaged uh, working with organization PAUSSA, uh, with women organization in, within uh, in PAUSSA, and it started with youth organization. I was, I participated uh, actively in youth organization and women organization in Guinea-Bissau. And uh, I participated, I, I worked in, in the government as a minister of social affairs and women promotion. After civil war in Guinea-Bissau, I joined the United Nations as working as a civil affairs officer in uh, East Timor and for about four years, and then in Haiti for about nine years. So this was my experience in uh, international organization, working with uh, people as a civil affairs officer, working with the uh, uh, grassroots people in, in, in Haiti to help the government uh, challenges, go through challenges uh, in, in, in Haiti and in uh, East Timor. Uh, our own fight, struggle in Guinea-Bissau was the first is that we are fighting for the independence, for the unity in Africa, in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde Island because we started with unity uh, of uh, Guinea-Bissau, unity in Cape Verde Island and then after the independence, fighting for the unity for Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde Island and for unity of Africa. And uh, this is challenge also for, this, for the Guinea-Bissau, for the struggle for uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, for the intern, we have to work because we know that you cannot feel free when you have independence in Guinea-Bissau and saying, okay, Guinea-Bissau is independent, now we gain our independence. But Guinea-Bissau cannot be independent if other countries continue to be under the oppression of imperialists. So, uh, 
But this is the challenges also that we do not only fight uh, for the country, but we fight in future to unite it. Uh, Africa as a, as a continent and the, to join forces with other uh, countries to uh, get independence. It is not only independence from the struggle uh, to get the independence, but in independence, mental independence also, uh, mentally, uh, to get uh, to our mentality, to change the mentality. And that for that we need to unite it for to unite forces. And the, the, the fight has to be international fight. And all countries, progressist progressist countries have to join uh, forces to to liberate themselves from the imperialist oppression. And that's the it becomes internationally uh, uh, join our forces so that we, we can liberate our own countries and, and liberate, uh, uh, well, yes, liberate our own countries and join forces for that. Uh, this is where I see internationalism there, that we have to be together, to have to join our forces so that we go for, forward with, uh, uh, to liberate the countries, liberate the continent, African continent, which continue always under the imperialist pr uh, oppression. This is uh, the way I understand it. Um, it was very uh, uh, important, the support that we got, that solidarity that we got from other African country. Example, concrete example, is Guinea Conakry with his, our neighboring country. At the time, Sekou Touré was a president. Um, he did, he, he left PAIGC, established a headquarter in Guinea Bissau, uh, in Guinea Conakry. And that was a great support because we could not have headquarter in any part of Guinea Bissau, because Portuguese were bombarding everywhere. So we had to head um, a back, a backup. So we had a, 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 a headquarters in Guinea Conakry. And can you imagine that even Portuguese bombarded, invaded Guinea Conakry because of PIGC HQ in Guinea Conakry? So if we did not have that support, I'm not saying that we are not going to get our independence, but maybe it's going to be more difficult yet. So this has the support. Algeria, we sent children to study there. They gave us also material support, like army and things, arms and things like that. So these are all these African country sending a, a polit to form politically education in that, in that countries, and uh, and also when we just right from the beginning, those children are uh, no those children those militants who wanted to join uh, PAIGC, coming from Portugal, for example, if they could not just go anywhere, travel like you can travel normally to get to Guinea, uh, to, Guinea to join PAGC. You have to go through a country which are supporting Guinea-Bissau because otherwise they could denounce you and the Portuguese could arrest you. So we needed that support from those countries so that we can get also people joining, militant joining PAGC to come through this, those countries to come to join them. So these are type of support, not only uh, material support, also as they gave to uh, PIGC. The struggle started in the villages, not in, it's in the cities. Mm -hmm. That was a change of strategy. And Cabral was very strict. 
the 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 struggle started in February 23 February 1963 and uh, one year later we had the behavior of some uh, combatants that were not in the same line that Cabral, the principal of the party. So Cabral has to convene a meeting, a big meeting, and that meeting transformed in Congress, and that transformed in first Congress of the party in 1964. That changed the strategy. Many combatants were punished because of their behavior. If we are fighting, we are asking people, supporting us, fighting with us, we should not abuse those pe these people. We have to be right with them. So any combatant, any combatant who changes, who do not respect the principle of the party is not a combatant anymore. So he was very strict on this. Mm. So that f our first Congress changed the way of the, the struggle. And that was also emphasized more education at that first Congress in 1964 at the Liberative Zone. When PAJC was created, we had, um, we have solidarity with many countries, progressist countries, like Cuba, like Czechoslovakia, like Soviet Union, like um, some even capitalist country that were had progressist organizations that were helping also uh, PAEJC. So within that framework, uh, we had Cubans also helping not only sending material things to help Guinea Bissau, but they volunteer to help to send doctors to help in, in the liberated zone, take care of the combatants that uh, were injured to uh, treat them. So that was, and Cuban, it was not only in Guinea Bissau. If you know the history of Cuba, Cuba helped many countries many countries with not only in the health sectors but in other way and the uh, cabral when we started working uh, with this solidarity with other progressive countries they wanted to send even soldier military to to help cabral said no we are able to fight ourselves but if you want to help us you can send that uh, army you can send us uh, uh, clothes, you can send us med medication things, but we do not want other people to come and fight for us. We are the one fighting for our independence. You can give us all type of... Uh, Cuba were there, but they did not fight. They were sent the doctor to help, to set a health, health system at the liberated zone. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, we gave the basic, you do not have a hospital, so you, you, you could give only the basic treatment, the, the combatants that were injured, and, and give also help to the local population at the liberated zone. As I said, we sent girls and, and, and boys to, to study as nurses and come back to, to help. Um. What is the legacy of revolutionary women like Titina Sila, Carmen Pereira and others? Yes, they, they left the legacy because um, they were the one women that showed w women of Guinea Bissau that women are capable, that they are not only uh, women being in uh, doing uh, domestic work, but they are also an active member of society. 
there were example, there were a mirror of women of Guinea-Bissau. Titina Sela, until now, they, they are our heroes. They are our national heroes. They are example of women. If we are keep going, fighting for the liberation of women, we are lo looking at this, what Titina Sela did, what Carmen Pereira did, what uh, uh, Francisca Pereira, she's still alive. And what uh, Theodora Ignacia Gomez, she's still alive. And these people inspire us. Today's women, we look what they did, the legacy of these women. And uh, they are our example for Guinea Bissau, women of Guinea Bissau. Could you tell us a bit more about how health was organized in the liberated territories? Right from the beginning, when we were still fighting, Amilcar Cabral sent up many uh, girls to the former Soviet Union, to ex-socialist uh, countries, to form, to, to educate, to form the nurses. And these nurses returned from the Soviet Union, and they were the one helping, it, uh, still at the liberated zone, the creative condition there, to uh, uh, treat. I mean, the, the combatants that were uh, fighting, and also to give a health uh, care for the population and liber at the liberated zone. That was the way it was. And we had also help from the Cuban, Cuban doctors. They were helping at the liberated zone, uh, helping uh, our uh, because also Cabral did everything to send people to study abroad so that they can return and help uh, create a help system uh, in Guinea, uh, 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 deliberated that in jungle. Can you imagine there? People during 11 years living in jungle and they managed to create conditions. You had a health system, uh, always the basic created in the liberated zone with the help of Cuban doctors. You have education, so people went to school. They did not have um, a desk. They did not have chair to sit on. They were sitting on the, these sticks there, they did not have really conditions for, but they did it under the bombardment of Portuguese. Children were, the school was there. Uh, the the students that were student, uh, that finished their study in Europe came back and went to jungle to uh, create school to teach children at the liberated zone. So that was, the, the things that uh, was impressing at that time. 11 years fighting for the independence there. And women, children, and the combatants were all engaged to, for liberation of the country. Wow. And can you imagine that people there for 11 years fighting, no conditions at all, and we decided that we will fight. Portuguese did not imagine such a small country with 90% illiteracy that we will be able to fight for, for to, to um, get Portuguese out of Guinea-Bissau. And we did it. With determination, we did get our independence. What did education look like in the liberated territories? We learned what was practical uh, learning, as I said, beginning to uh, start to know our own country, I mean history, beginning to know where Guinea-Bissau is located, geography, 
and also practical things, what we cultivate, agriculture, these small things, what are the crops that we cultivate in Guinea Bissau, Nut nutrition, what was the basic food that you should eat, change a habit. So this was the practical things that we learned. And also uh, learned how to cook, as I said, the culinary school at, at the liberated zone. The children had to learn about all this. There were no conditions, uh, special conditions there, because it was very difficult to find all this. But these were the basic things that children have to learn especially to know their history, to know where they come from, why are they fighting. It was also, at the same time, political education at school. So these were the basic things that we had to learn, learn in our history, our geography, where we are, and why are we fighting. That's our political work, uh, education. What is the role of the youth in struggle across Africa today? I think the very important thing as now as youth has to do, it depends on the, the system in, in every country and the progressive countries. If you want really to make a change, you have to focus on education. And if you have educated children from the beginning, the value to val uh, I mean, of, of, of the country, I mean, why we need a change. And the, this change has to come from the youth from, to, to fight to change the, the thing. Because if you see the discrimination in the world. You are independent, but you continue to be oppressed. You have to teach children to uh, know how to distinguish things. And in Geneva, for example, after the independence, we are now confronting different political uh, parties there are some progressive political parties, there are some uh, democratic, there's I democrat, but democracy. You have to teach the, the, the children, the youth, from the beginning. This is a political education to know, focus in what we want. And the, this helps a lot to beginning to teach the children to value their own whatever they have in their country, that this is what we have to defend. And this is what we continue, because otherwise, Pierre said that fought for the independence. If we just, after the independence, we left that, then we, the children, the young generation now, we, we should continue, teach them the value what motivated us to go for 11 years to stay in jungle fighting Portuguese? This political power. We did not have army. We did not have heavy army to confront the Portuguese. We received help from ex-socialist countries to receive the first arm that we received, PIS studies were from Algeria from Czechoslovakia, sending us army so that we could start fighting. But that was determination that we should make a change. Portuguese were there fighting us, oppressing us, doing us, no education, no, no uh, health system that was working. We were forced to work, our ancestor, we're forced to force work, but we had to. We have to change that thing. We have to change our mind so that we think different. We think our country. 
So children has to, again, we have to begin with political education to change the mind of children. And that is very important. To value their own culture. To value their culture. Because, yes, the, 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 the world is, uh, is evolving. Youth now, okay, whatever is happening in the United Nations, uh, United Nations, United States, in France, in, 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 in Portugal, in other European countries, children, youth want also to do these things. They don't have it in their countries. So they are attracted to different things. But what is happening that youth actually will value more things coming from outside than the things that they have. We have to educate our children, our young, young people to value what they have. If you begin for this education, then in the future, you have different way of thinking, different values to start to, to know more about our history. Where did we begin? Where are we now? Where are we going tomorrow? So I think uh, it is educating educating our children. That is there to start from a young age so that we know if, as I said, if we did not do that, we could not, the PAJC could not resist for how many years now, almost 50 years. The PAJC was created in 1956 and the ideology continue now. We continue teaching people, showing why did we fight for 11 years in jungle, 11 years, under the mosquitoes, under the, 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 the snakes, all these animals there, 11 years, no conditions at all. What motivated people, us, to do that? 11 years, no 11 months, not 11 days, 11 years in the jungle. It was a very strong political motivation and the patriotic education, patriot, patriotic de determination that led us for, to fight for the independence in a very difficult conditions. Following the struggle for independence, how did political education take place? Uh, after that, because PAIGC <coughs> had ideological school. We still have ideological uh, school in, in Guinea-Bissau, uh, teaching young people about their political, uh, about the policy, the why uh, PAGC was created and why motivated PAGC to mobilize people to go adhere to the idea, ideology of PAGC. We have that ideological school in PAGC area. Do you have any additional comments? Cabral was an exceptional person. He was humane. He was a poet. He was a combatant. And uh, really, the, the thing that most strikes is a humanity. He was a humane. Mm. Many people that did wrong he said, okay, we are just human beings. You make me err, uh, uh, I mean, mistake. Yeah, you should be given opportunity. 
you should be given opportunity. When you recognize your mistake, you should be given opportunity also to reintegrate you. Mm. Unfortunately, many of those people who were punished in the first congr uh, Congress of the uh, party, they were the one, although they were forgiven, but they were the ones, they were not satisfied. They felt that they were punished. Mm. They were the ones the Portuguese mobilized to kill Cabral. Mm. Yeah. They were the ones who mobilized to kill Cabral. So it's not easy. You may a struggle, you have to be really have a principle. And you have to stick on that principle. You have to be strict, but in, in certain principle, <clears throat> you, you cannot just uh, deviate. Mm. There are some principles you may just be flexible, but there are principles you cannot deviate. If it were not that, we could not stay, fight for 11 years in jungle, in these conditions, to get our independence. Mm -hmm.